The point has been made by many that strength standards are worthless, and I do get where they're coming from. They can be set by criteria that doesn't have anything to do with you, they can be completely subjective, and the truth is whatever progress you can or can't make doesn't hinge on what these lists say, so it can be a distraction. I'm reminded of how people will compulsively check their credit score, even though that doesn't make it go up it actually makes it go down. But I don't agree with the statement that they're worthless. Scarcity is what adds value to things, and a list of standards tells you what performances are rare and what performance is a run of the mill. That's information that you need to know to frame your training and your goals. The problem occurs when your gluttonous ego leads you to misuse them. We're gonna get to that, but first, let's see what some of these standards say. We're gonna cut to the most verifiable source of data, which comes from powerlifting. Whether you compete or not, everybody uses the squat bench deadlift as a proxy for strength, but using actual competitive numbers, it eliminates the problems of lifters self-reporting their numbers with that arbitrary 10% padding because I'm good for it, bro. And of course, making sure there is something that looks like a consistent technical standard is kind of important. Thanks to the gents at openpowerlifting.com and the nerds of Reddit who spent countless hours crunching this data for our benefit, we can see how most of the lifts through history stack up in a nice, clean infographic. Shout out to Rockhound22 and Tristan Oakley for putting this up in the R Powerlifting subreddit some years back. I linked the original thread below if you want to see every weight class included or the women's weight classes, or you can download the zip file from my site so you don't have to download each image independently. We're going to cover the rough spread of weight classes. I included the 183, the 231, and the super heavy weight classes. And then there is an aggregate list at the end that removes weight classes. Classes, kind of like pride fighting for powerlifting, which would be really awesome. Now, real quick, this vid was brought to you by my new baby. No, not that baby, this baby. Stick around to the very end for more info on the Base Strength AI app or hit the link below. Now, we're going to start out by pointing out the impact the body weight has at the tail end of the bell curve. We have the biggest numbers coming from guys with the most fat around their ankles, knees, hips, and midsection, and that's because fat doesn't compress. It's like having a built-in squat suit. That's not a joke or an exaggeration. Anybody who has gone between 25% and 15% body fat can attest to how completely different the lift feels, and it's absolutely an asset. Now, I went out of my way to circle the mid-range where the most common lifts are represented. That's not to say, hey, these lifts are really mundane. You should feel like a piece of shit. That's actually to show you the lifts you're likely to see in a powerlifting meet. So if you fall comfortably in this range or even close to it, you know you're going to be in close company if you go to a meet. So you shouldn't feel like an outsider because you only have a 375 squat. These numbers are represented far more often than you think. And they're also relatively attainable. So it should motivate you from both ends to know that a, you can get there with enough work, and B, once you do, you will fit right in with the rest of the other powerlifting weirdos. So most common squats represented in the 183 look to be between 300 and 450. That looks to shift forward a range from 350 to 500 for the 231s, and then once again to 450 to 600 for the super heavyweights. Now I highlighted in purple, if you wanna take it a step forward, let's say you're right dead center in the middle of that bell curve and you wanna be competitive, you want people to know you as a strong squatter, a five 500 pound squat in the 183 class will make you the top 7% of people to have ever squatted in all of powerlifting. And keep in mind, guys, this includes tested and untested federations. Now, before you lose your shit about that, remember that if you're surprised with where you stand here, what that means is that you don't have to say, oh, I'm pretty strong for a natty. You get to say, hey, I'm just pretty strong. And isn't that a nice breath of fresh air? The 231s of 550 squatting up is the top 12.5%. And if you get a 600 pound squat, you're in the top 4.5% of lifters. And then finally, with the super heavyweights, rolling around comfortably over 300 pounds, top 6%, anything 700 and over. That is a highly competitive number. And even a 650 squat is in the top 12%. As we jump to the real chart, no weight classes in the jungle, bro. We see all of the weight classes consolidated, not just the ones I included, but all weight classes in the sport. And some things stand out. First of all, the tail end of the bell curve. This is the one giving us a complex. This is why better health is becoming so popular because we spend all of our time on IG looking at this tail end of the bell curve. Notice that the 300 pound range between 800 and 1100 has less than 100 people in it over a 300 pound range. And if you jump down to 750, that's less than 200 people represented in all of those numbers. Most of the lifts over all tested and untested lifters in every weight class occur between 350 
and 500. If you're anywhere in there, you are going to be right at home at a powerlifting meet. You're going to be surrounded by other people lifting what you lift. And if you're above a 550 squat, again, regardless of tested or untested status and weight class, that's top eight and a half percent of all squatters. A 550 squat for most people after a decade of religious work in squatting is very attainable. So this should make you feel like numbers that qualify as impressive, not just for the general population, not just for the fat shits that don't know the difference between a 225 or 405 bench, but for people that actually compete, that is enough to stand out and be known as a strong guy that should be very empowering now as we move to the deadlift we're going to see some statistical fuckery because of the sumo deadlift that's my favorite thing to talk about i go out of my way to point that out here because if you're a conventional puller you don't want to spend too much time comparing yourself to people who have a plus 15 ape index start their pull with their toes touching the plates and lock the bar out on their kneecaps because it's a different animal so you can take some of these with a grain of salt notice that the maximums between the 231 and the super heavies you're talking about 100 pounds difference in average body weight or more they both have people represented in the 950 to 1000 pound range this is the only lift where that happens squat bench clean and jerk snatch all correlate very heavily to body weight when it comes to predicting strength outcomes the sumo changes that a bit but we still see a pretty even trek forward for the average pulls and that's probably because there aren't so many really technical advantage sumo pullers in the general population of lifters. You really see the guys exploit that become the outliers. So most of the pulls in the 183s, we're looking at 400 to 550. Even if you're 350 to 400, you're still in close company with all of these pullers. And that shifts forward a range all the way down to the super heavyweights, where it looks like 500 to 650 is the normal range. Remember, these are guys that are rolling around well over 300 pounds. If you're over a 550 deadlift, congratulations. In the 183 class, that's a top 13% of lifters. You're looking at about one in nine. As we get into the 231, it's a very competitive class. There's just more people that have the frame that can support this weight at a relatively lean body weight. So you see a bigger talent pool, you just see crazier numbers. But in the 231s, top six and a half percent if you're at 650 and up even if you're at above a 600 that shows that that's still better than four out of five lifters in the 231 class you go to the super heavies 700 pound pull now again weighing well over 300 pounds top 10 percent of deadlifts are 700 pounds and up so those are the competitive numbers even a 650 pull for a super heavyweight again beating out four out of five lifters by putting you in the top 21 percent all right now as we get into the aggregate we're going to see the overwhelming majority of deadlifts happening in these three ranges between 400 and 550. if you add up these deadlifts that's more than all of the other deadlifts done in any other range 600 and up that puts you in the top 10% about 11.2%. And you know what? If you pull it conventional, go ahead and give yourself another little pat on the back. Even if you're at a 550 pull, which again is very manageable as a single for a lot of people, that puts you well in the top quartile. And that's not just in your weight class. That's out of all weight classes, tested and untested. Again, you get to say, hey, I'm not pretty strong for a natty. I'm just pretty strong. Once you get comfortable framing your strength that way, trust me when I say you're not going to want to go back to hyper qualifying every performance you do with a bunch of different categories. Now, this is what most of you are probably here for. These are the bench rankings. So a couple things here, you're going to see weight move weight because more weight likely to have bigger upper body. You need mass in your shoulders, your back, your arms to move a lot of weight in the bench press. As a general rule, there's less technical wizardry you can do unless you have the build you know, where you look like a wiener dog and you have short arms and a high arch from your long ass disproportionate torso. But even as much of a meme as that is in powerlifting, that's a pretty rare build. You don't see that actually as much as you might think. Now, the average ranges in all of powerlifting in the 183s between 200 and 300 pounds. This makes up such a big chunk of bench press is done here. So case in point, even if you have a 225 bench and you feel bad about it, if you are firmly over that 200 pound mark, look where you're at. You are smack dab in the range of what is normal to see in a powerlifting meet. I talked about no man's land. That is again, strong enough to be much stronger than everybody else who's just contributing to the cheese stains in their futon, but not quite strong enough to get uh, recognition for it. But even if you're in martial arts, if you get a yellow belt, 
that means something. It's a launching pad. You started your journey, but you're already more competent, more capable than the general population. So you should be proud of that. You shouldn't be scared to go demonstrate your strength and test yourself on a platform. Now, if you want something to chase, top 10%, you're going to beat out nine out of 10 lifters with a 350 bench. And some of you young powerlifters might think that's an astronomical feat, but I'm telling you, the reason these numbers feel so skewed compared to squatting and deadlifting is because everybody and their mom benches and you get a ton of people out in the world who bench press, but don't squat or deadlift, or at least don't do it well or seriously. And the people that love it excel at it. So if you bench press and you train upper body generally out of love, even out of the vanity aspect, just because you like watch yourself grow in the mirror, that's going to fuel your bench press a lot more than hyper fixating on whatever percentage based optimized powerlifting program you're running. So some of you might want to consider kind of rerouting how you address your upper body because your potential to move weight is probably a lot higher than you think. You get into the 231s and you see a 400 pound bench is top 13%. Now most of the lifts happening between 250 and 400 pounds. Still a 250 bench weighing 231 pounds puts you in the mix. And the fact is if you're legit 230 and you're benching 250, it probably means you're a little fat. It probably means you're carrying around some excess weight, which means you have room to either drop body fat and get into a lower weight class or to fill out your frame, in which case your bench is just going to skyrocket. So it should be good news for just about everybody here. And then of course the heavy weights putting up ridiculous numbers. Again, if you're rolling over 300 pounds, you got all that cushion around your chest, shoulders, triceps. And a lot of these guys got big frames. They got that big barrel chest that just looks like it was built to rest a loaded barbell on most of these lifts are happening between the 300 and 450 range a 500 bench that's kind of what you need to set yourself apart in the super heavyweights if you really want to be known as the strong bencher in the super heavyweights weigh in 320 350 finally we see the aggregate list you got the top spot that's obviously julius maddox the only person between 750 and 800 and again we're seeing this range of hundreds of pounds populated by few people, only 130 people between 600 and 800. And again, most of the lifts that you're ever going to see are going off in this band between 200 and 350. So again, that 225 example should make you feel good because it's A, better than the population, B, easily attainable, and C, it's par for the course in a powerlifting meet. So that should be good news all the way around. So now that we went over those numbers, I gotta go on a rant. The intelligent way to use these tables is to see how common your abilities are, chart them against what you think you can achieve, and then decide rationally what your path forward's going to be. But that's logical decision-making that comes from secure people. Lifters, on the other hand, are prone to having self-esteem that's about as sturdy as the umbrella cracker from Squid Game. Many watching this probably still aren't even satisfied with the insane amount of data that I just presented to you because there's no filter based on natty status, height, medical history, socioeconomic status, or whatever other inconsequential bullshit you happen to obsess over. So I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about something more important than just the list or how you actually stack up on it, and that's all the way that you're going to make use of this list to hurt your training instead of helping it. Let's get to that gluttonous ego that I was talking about. And we got to start by diving into idiot gym culture. The first aspect of idiot gym culture is having standards that are way too low. This is where perpetual underperformers want to win the status game, get more recognition, but not by doing better, grinding harder, having bigger shoulders to support heavier burdens, but just by reframing their performance so that it appears to be more substantive than it is. This is done through an insane fixation on individual differences. We know what they are. It's leverages, it's PED use, it's genetics, and it's literally any other type of perceived privilege, whether it actually is one or not. Now, a lot of people intuit that you can game the fuck out of this, and you can. When you're winning, you can insist that you are representative of the broader group. Case in point, this one grinds my gears. Every time there's a strongman contest called something like New England's Strongest Patriot, there will be a flood of contest recaps on Instagram where the competitors literally type out fifth strongest person in New England. Not bad. No, that's not even kind of what that means, and you should be arrested for filleting yourself in public. When these same people are losing, on the other hand, they flip the script and they'll demand a chart that is so detailed and bracketed down that it removes anyone who might otherwise be ranked above them. For instance, the guy who has orangutan-like limbs will dismiss their role in helping him get a state deadlift record. He's just like, that fucking good. But his bench is only 297? Long arms, bro. It's a curse. 
when this poor sport status gaming infects the ranks of newer lower level lifters who don't really have any strengths to speak of, it absolutely warps their young impressionable minds and it impacts the culture of competition downstream. Their sense of sportsmanship gets overtaken like the tractors in Fern Gully by the singing tar monster. This is where you get black pilled lifters, the people who think their struggle is a sign of the impossibility of it all. So every loss is from an unfair advantage, every natural influencer is lying, the flying space wizards in Marvel movies shouldn't have abs that unrealistic and that the pinnacle of natural human achievement is to do five pull-ups while looking like penis slug Jerry. Sandow and co were super jacked before steroids were even invented? Well, obviously they were on steroids. Here's the flow chart of conversation you can expect from one of these guys when you tell them you have a 225 pound bench. Are you a male? Yes. Are you old enough to drink? Yes. Well, you should be that strong grandpa. You've been doing it long enough. Oh, you're not old enough to drink. Are you above 200 pounds? Yes. Well, I'd be that strong if I was as fat as you too. You're under 200 pounds. Okay. Are you under five foot six? Yes. Well, lifting's easier for short people. You're fucking weak. No, you're not under five foot six. Are you over six feet tall? Yes. Well, lifting's easier for tall people. You're fucking weak. Okay. You're between five, six and six foot. You're under 200 pounds. You're a young kid. Are you natty? No. Steroids are cheating. You're weak. Well, I just finished my first creatine cycle. I just said steroids are cheating. I'm a hundred percent natty. You're a liar and you're weak. Okay. Let's say you're natty. Did you play sports as a kid? No. Was your dad around? No. Well, did he pay child support? Yes. Must be nice to have that privilege upbringing. You're fucking weak. Okay, no, I had a deadbeat dad who afforded me no extra privilege in life. I was as disadvantaged as they come. Are you sure you're natty? Yes. That's impossible, bro. And this cycle continues on. Now, the funny thing is when you tell any one of these guys that it's a female who benches 225, they'll concede that that is the world champ, but follow it up with the predictable list that she has cheater genetics is obviously on steroids and looks like a man. Now, anytime you try to set these people straight by suggesting that their struggle to get even a basic amount of strength probably means there's something wrong with their fundamentals, you will get borderline threats of violence in return. The black pill hates any advice that has to do with the fundamentals because obviously their fundamentals are on point. Are you saying I didn't try hard enough? What are you, a fascist? People have to understand that there is not one master chart that can predict gains based on just genetics. Your potential is ultimately going to be based on how crazy dedicated you are. And there's like nine subdivisions. Yes, nine. And they range from, I can't go to the gym today, my stories is on, to I've had three cortisone shots in my knee so I don't have to drop my squat frequency going into this meet. Whether you wanna hear it or not, most of you are around a level three. Now this chart on the y-axis shows your actual training outcomes, how jacked you are or aren't, and we're going to see that that increases based on how much of a fucking nut you are. How high or low this line is for any one particular person depends on their genetic potential. Of course, that's gonna change, but this is what you can do. Now, all the way to the top right is the imaginary you, the hypothetical perfect you if you did everything in your power, if you lived in a Soviet work camp where your whole job was to consume protein and do concentration curls. This is you at your most jacked where people throw roses and panties at you on stage. Your ex comes to your bodybuilding show and screams during your routine that she wants you to take her back. Now this dominates our delusions and is an expression of all of our dysfunctions. It gets packaged with all of the other bullshit going on in our heads because we don't just fixate on looking jacked and being strong so that we impress all the people around us. This is tied into our sense of self-esteem, whether our dad's gonna give us his approval, like whether our boss is finally gonna talk to us with a bit of respect, there's a bunch of imaginary shit we attach to this. But the bottom line is if you go as crazy as fucking possible, this hypothetical imaginary you, that's as close as you're going to get to it. Now on the y-axis, your actual outcome ranges from zero, which is weak, no muscle, almost dead. Think of the guy in seven who was strapped to the bed for a year so that he would atrophy into fucking nothing. And then at the top, that's you incredibly jacked, probably pro-level jacked, but also almost dead. Now my very scientific ranking system of nine levels of fucking crazy, we got three bands. We got hardly interested to reasonably interested to this is my entire life and I only feel love from a barbell. Now going from a three or a four, you have people that are like consistently doing enough to grow, but they're leaving a shit ton on the table by being inconsistent or not really paying attention to what they're doing. These are usually people that have an unreasonable work schedule or it's people that go through like binge purge cycles of training where they're really consistent for a couple months, then fuck off and get drunk three nights a week for months at a time. If you're under a two, you either really don't care about training 
or you do care about training and you just have some type of cognitive impairment that prevents you from having any type of impulse control. Now, going from a zero to a three, somewhere where you're actually going to start to get closer to your potential, somewhere in the realm of normal, you're gonna see the absolute biggest swings. It's also the easiest thing to do. It's just fixing the big rocks, showing up, putting out some effort, and doing what the average gym guy does. There's no optimization here, there's just not fucking up and that provides a massive increase in your outcomes now once you get to the realm of normalcy you're looking at anything between like a three and a six people that move around in the realm of normalcy are going to see improvements but a lot of it's fine tuning most of it isn't going to be stuff that shows some monumental increase in your potential outcome it's really once you get into batshit crazyville that you start doing things that give a bigger return but they also tend to come at a bigger cost so this is like training every day. This is like ignoring injury. This might even be taking a crazy amount of drug. Once you get into batshit crazyville, now you're talking about sacrificing so much, including your physical and mental health, that you're going to start to see a return that's just not going to be seen by anybody else, at least if you stay in one piece long enough to realize it. So this is where we think of some of the craziest performers who have done the most. Here's some reference for what it is to be fucking crazy. This is me rupturing my bicep flipping a tire. I've shown this on this channel multiple times. Instead of getting it repaired, I made Laura take me to Cheesecake Factory right after. This is me that same week testing out what I could do with it. This is me one week later, front squatting 500 pounds and strict pressing 245 for 12. I'm maybe a seven on this list. To the black pillars who think JVS is a fake natty and the advice to train harder and tighten up your sleep, diet, and consistency is condescending, it must be nice to live in a fantasy world where your efforts represent the pinnacle of human commitment to excellence. So to summarize, yeah, people that are fucking insane will outperform those who are rational. And no, you don't get a separate chart that doesn't have them on it. Now, about those fucking insane people, this is the other side of idiot gym culture. People who have standards that are just way too high. Now, this does exist in strength sports, people that will burn themselves into the ground because they think they have to get that top spot or they're not shit. But bodybuilding is actually really notorious for this. It's where participants feel the pressure of needing to be the best of the best, lest they be validated as the failure that they feel like they are. It's the vain nature of the sport, the extreme lifestyle of training and dieting, the cocktail of hormones and opiates needed to keep them going. It tends to attract a personality type that is already off. And they also get rewarded for each extra unit of crazy they bring. Many of these people also live in dysfunction and they'll choose to clock hours in the gym, pursuing increasingly marginal gains instead of just getting the basics of their life in order. Pop lifting culture tends to romanticize crazy sex like West Side or the Bulgarian team because they're synonymous with winning at all costs. We hear the stories of powerlifters ignoring their kids because they have a meet coming up, or bodybuilders living out of their car while they're delinquent on payments at risk of getting it repoed, but spending money on protein and a gym membership. We all know David Goggins, who got famous by his crazy approach to getting in shape. He went from being overweight and relatively untrained to jumping into a 100-mile ultra marathon, and he bragged about breaking his feet and pissing himself. Any runner would tell you that this is insane. Pushing your body is not the same as breaking it, and when this is made to represent the ultimate path to success, it contributes to this dysfunction where the culture starts to ignore more mundane and easily accessible plays for growing and gaining success. Instead, they hold high extreme outliers who use strategies that should have killed them and have actually killed others. It's not impressive when these people who have practiced self-neglect through most of their life in a moment of mania decide to strip naked, cover themselves in cocoa butter, and then run through a minefield. What's impressive is they didn't happen to step on one. The fact is nobody should use lifting as an obsessive escape and no one should see gym PRs or competitive placings as the thing that justifies extreme emotional dysregulation. Andrew Clayton is a high performer if there ever was one. He has both a middleweight and heavyweight pro card and strongman. And right now, even after blowing out his knee, is on a comeback that has made him one of the most untouchable people in the middleweight class. He's been open about his bipolar disorder and he put a list of destructive things that he would do as part of his search for the top spot. Now, if you took Andrew's list around the pump room in a bodybuilding competition or around the athlete area at World's Strongest Man, the best performers would relate to this list more than they wouldn't. But you know who doesn't relate to this? The Black Pillars. Now, as we take this back to the question at hand, which is standards, you have to understand that very, very few people actually train to be the best. And that's important when you're comparing yourself against these high performers. 
even if you had all the genetic advantages and the luck of perfect opportunity, becoming the best requires time spent doing shit that sucks, worrying about razor thin margins, and sacrificing really good healthy shit in pursuit of it, and sometimes it requires rubbing yourself down with cocoa butter and running through a minefield. If this entire audience found out that their genetics were one in a million and I gave them a plan that would guarantee a world record, 99% wouldn't follow through. And it's not just because it would be hard and time consuming, it would cost you personal time with loved ones, your mental health, your physical health. To be the best, liking the gym isn't enough. Liking winning isn't even enough. You have to love to win. You have to need it to an unhealthy degree. So it's great that you wouldn't take that path because it means you're in this for more substantive reasons than just arbitrarily slapping 10 kilograms on your lift. Lifting has so much to give everybody. It's good for you. It gives consistency to your life, a project to chip away at. It tells you that you're in control, that you have influence over the way your life goes. It validates you, grounds your mood with physical stress and exhaustion. It can sharpen and mold you in a way that's additive. And it can give you stories to tell interested outsiders that signals you did something with your life besides contributing to the oily dent in your sofa. All of these things are the most valuable parts of lifting and none of them have anything to do with your proximity to the top spot. And in most cases, those in the top spot have foregone these benefits. I can't stress this enough. The only happy former world record holders are people who would have been happy anyways. Now, if we take this bell curve of genetics without taking into account anything else, you're gonna see that most people have normal genetics or better genetics. Let's assume that you have shit genetics. You still have upward mobility. Everybody does. It's entirely possible to go from shit genetics to working hard enough that you still place ahead of most of the people that don't have shit genetics. Let's reimagine this graph with this bottom plateau being the middle of the bell curve. This is most of you on the plateau of mediocrity, looking through your telescope fixated, not on the next step, but at the people at the very top, waving a flag, flipping you off, having their dick hang out in the wind. The eternal mistake that people commit is becoming obsessed with these top spots and how far away they are from that position. And in that way, the top spot becomes the only thing worth chasing, where it's almost either I'm able to get there or it's not even worth doing. What passes them by is how easy it is to skip up to the next level and how much of a gap that represents in quality of life. The truth is it becomes harder to traverse each step on the way up as you get closer to the top spot. And it also gives you less returns to the rest of your life. Most people aren't going to be better off going absolute berserker mode and sacrificing time and effort to push the boundaries of their physical performance. Nobody bagged a hotter girl or got their father's approval because they went from 365 to 455 on the bench, even though that represents much higher status in this specific domain. Even for specific competitive goals, the math is gonna be different for everyone as far as what they'll risk versus what they're gonna get back in return. I know my limitations and I'm sure as shit not going to go from a seven to a nine on the crazy scale even if it would have taken my fifth place finish at Worlds to a first. Now, on the other hand, if you're all the way to the left on this curve, if you look like Christian Bale from The Machinist, you have trouble supporting your own weight going up a flight of stairs, you're in dire straits, and you have a lot to gain just by getting to the realm of normalcy. This means that calculation might be different for you. If disability, injury, or just some real shit genetics makes it so normal, can only be gotten by going absolutely fucking nuts, the return in health, capability, self-esteem, and dating options might make that trade-off a no-brainer. This is actually the inspiration for my sub-novice beginner program. I'm gonna call it Auschwitz to Average. You can cringe at that joke, but when you learn that Greg Knuckles renamed Average to Savage because somebody complained it was offensive to natives, it becomes a lot funnier. So wherever you're standing on this platform, if the next step up is one that's relatively easy, if it represents the start of your journey where you are on an exponential upswing and it provides a massive return to your quality of life, all of you are not just justified, you are obligated to do everything you can to try to make that trip because it will benefit you and thusly benefit everybody around you. When the fixation on the top spot though discourages people from doing what they can to make these easy improvements, well, it's like giving up a six-figure raise because billionaires. There's a point where I'm just not charitable to your struggles. So here's some rules to avoid when evaluating standards. It will not only make you a more mature, respectable adult, it will get you the respect of your friends, peers, and competitors, but it will also take you farther. Keep your mental health sane and allow you to enjoy this more. Thing number one, do not reverse engineer for yourself a first place trophy by looking at all of the factors that you can fixate on to make an incredibly small talent pool to compare yourself to. All this means is that you're looking down. You're not looking at getting better. You're looking at 
staying where you are. This is the lifter equivalent of, I woke up like this, no work needed. And all the basic women around you are still gonna tell you you're beautiful. That's not how this should go. The point is to move forward. And that means growing out of your talent pool. Thing number two, don't be unreasonably hard on yourself. This is the other extreme. Don't view this as the thing that is going to be the source of all of your happiness. If you're unhealthy or 40% body fat, yes, absolutely. Getting your house in order basically is going to provide big returns to everything else. But when we're talking about the fringe, the margins, the frivolous amounts of strength and muscularity that we're searching for, no, that is not the key to making you whole or complete. Thing number three, don't ignore advantages in your wins. I always like to approach my victories as if I got lucky and I always like to approach my losses as if it was my fault. I think that's a relatively healthy outlook for a competitor to have. So when you do win, think about who didn't show up that day. Think about the calls that went your way that might've been iffy. Think about your advantages, your leverages. You can't go into another sport like strongman, if you have a very twisted idea of how strong you are, because let's say you have a very good sumo deadlift, you have to be able to pick apart your performances and say, okay, this lift is good, but given the reasons I'm good at it, does it say that I'm strong as I want to consider myself as being in all these other domains? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. You have to be very honest and objective. Thing number four, don't explain away your losses. This goes back to what I said about treating your losses like there's something you could have done because they're almost always is. When you do take a loss, when you do fail to improve, it doesn't matter if it's in a contest or just in setting that gym PR, take inventory of all the things you could have done that you could have tightened up and assume that all of those are relevant in getting you to the next level. Thing number five, don't gain strength and hold it up as the same. It's perfectly fine to gain strength for powerlifting purposes to stand on the platform and earn more points than the other guy in service of winning. That's what the sport is. But there's absolutely no reason that strength culture as a whole shouldn't pick that apart or analyze it for what it is. Because when you're concerned about strength as a functional tool, that's a completely different thing. And when it comes to your long-term physical development, you need to understand the difference. Thing number six, don't ignore your potential by staying in easier waters. This is kind of the same as not reverse engineering a first place trophy. Outgrow those waters. Don't keep your weight down. You get stronger by gaining muscle. The weight that you started at as a 135 pound weakling, untrained, is not the class you're supposed to stay in for the rest of your life. You have to outgrow. You should look forward to taking losses from bigger people. Thing number seven, don't fixate on body weight ratios. It's completely meaningless. People fix it on body weight ratios because they're small and they need a reason to have that look more impressive. If you are an American Ninja Warrior, it's relevant. If you are an elite powerlifting competitor, it's also relevant. If you engineer the perfect body that you want, it's probably going to have you actively trying to add muscle and that's going to jack your lifts up. But when you walk into a bar, nobody fucking asks you about your dot score. So if you are fixated on body weight ratios, understand why and understand that the average person doesn't care about that as much as you think that they do. Thing number eight, don't ignore body fat. So again, this is the opposite of that. Body fat in excess is unhealthy and it makes you useless in a whole bunch of things. Some people know why they do it. This is the same as being a very light competitor. You have the Andrew Richards of the world, the Glenn Rosses of the world, the people that super bulk and get big as shit. They know why they're chasing that extreme, but they know it. They don't just take for granted that, well, I'm stronger, so you can't ask any questions. The average person is not better for doing that. You should want to be useful in all domains, especially if you are not an elite competitor. Look to your whys. Is this improving your life? Is this making you better the ways you wanna be better? And thing number nine, understand your progress in service of goals that are congruent with your values. That is the only thing that matters. External numbers are just stars on a wide horizon. As you make that distance towards the horizon, the only thing that matters is that you take any step but backwards. So we're gonna jump right into it. We're gonna talk about the new project. I'm very excited to bring you Base Strength AI. No matter what program you do, eventually progress is gonna stall. That balance of stress and recovery is gonna get a little wonky. And the only way you keep going is if you personalize it to yourself. So as far as the application, Base Strength AI, it's not generative AI. It's not, hey, chat GPT, write me a program. This is all fine-tuned, exhaustive decision-making that we set based on the information you put in. So to start, there's a huge questionnaire, everything from your lifting style, your perceived weaknesses, your tolerance to work, your training history, all of these things get factored in to trying to set a good starting point for you. That is put against a backdrop 
of my templates. Now I think my app is unique in that I have three to choose from, where the others, there's just kind of a default, like this is how we program. The ones we have are Bull Massive, 70s Powerlifter, probably two of the most popular ones. And then Block is a new one. It is a very long, I think 24 week block periodization structure. They all differ substantially based on how much barbell work there is, the set and rep scheme, and the method of periodization. Well, I started out thinking this is a cool gadget for people that are just highly serious and want the ultimate edge on their training, or for people that just like trying new shit, that try every new app when it comes out, or for people that just wanted to offload their decision-making completely onto somebody else. All valid reasons to try this out. But as time went on, I started to see this more as something that inevitably had to be the replacement for remote coaching. All of the things that are important moment to moment are things that are usually outside of the control of a remote coach. This cuts that out at the knees because every time you plug in information, you're getting direct feedback. Like, nope, this is what you're doing now. This didn't go as planned, this is plan B. Oh, this went really well, you're sandbagging it, kick it up a notch. So all of that is taken from the beginning through each workout, through each week, through each block for as long as you run the programs. And again, that makes every single program you run viable to you. And look, if you're not a guy that's sauced out of his mind or have all the elite genetics, this is the type of stuff that you wanna tighten up. So hopefully this will help people the way I really truly think that it will. So if any of that sounds interesting, go to basestrength.com, try it out, there's a free trial. Again, so much gratitude, really happy to be part of this cutting edge tech. The tagline is, the heart of old school training, the mind, of cutting edge AI. Do you like that tagline? I'm really fucking proud of that tagline. I came up with that at like 4 a.m. when I was screwing with the website on like Sunday, the night before it was supposed to launch. It's not just that it's catchy, it's that I really think that encapsulates how I feel about this. I wanted to use technology, science, in a way that was actionable, in a way that actually provided something tangible that could directly make your training better. But I also wanted to preserve what I thought was the bare bones, the soul, the heart of what training is. And that is good movements done with a lot of effort consistently for a lot of work driven forward over time. Like just being on a war path, I need to grow like it's my job. That heart is baked into these programs. That's what you're gonna experience if you run through it. And you're gonna know flat out, no bones about it. Am I running this program the way Bromley wanted me to? So hit the link. Thanks again, till next time. This is Bromley, I'll see ya.